If you were to start a new society, how would you do it? How would you decide the type of government you wanted, the kind of legal system to put in place, and how to create wealth in your new society? These are exactly the kinds of questions which the early Australian colonists were asking in the 19th century. The Australian colonists had a big challenge. They had to decide what sort of institutions they were going to choose. Were they going to be a protectionist or free trade? Um, a set of colonies? Were they um, going to focus on individual liberty or were they going to be the military um, prison outpost that they were originally established as? They were grappling with the really big ideas um, that we now take for granted. Um, liberty, fraternity, um, participation, roles and responsibilities and what sort of system of government should apply to a people. But when it came to these really big ideas, the early colonists didn't have to start from scratch. They already had the benefit of centuries of accumulated knowledge. The European settlement of Australia came at a time in the history of Western civilization when ideas about the role of government, individual liberty, religion and science had been debated, tried and tested. We call this period the Enlightenment. The Enlightenment was a movement of ideas in the 18th century it wasn't really a sort of set of precepts. It was really more an attitude of mind, how you looked at society and its problems. I mean, the Enlightenment it, you know, isn't a tidy... F I present it like in one sentence, but obviously it's not a tidy formula, right? No. It's people arguing all the time. It's, it's a, you know, like any intellectual movement. The Enlightenment is important because it gave us the freedoms which underpin modern society. Enlightenment ideas such as freedom of speech, religion and opinion, the right to property, free enterprise, and the nature of democracy are still being debated and discussed today. It comes in the wake of two important things. First of all, the scientific revolution of the 17th century, and that does a lot to shape the thinking of the Enlightenment. The other movement that it responds to is the religious wars of the 17th century. The religious wars set off by the Reformation meant that society had to find other bases than a shared religion to De develop its political institutions. It was a time of great debate um, and, and there were a great number of philosophers um, and lawyers having these big debates about these really essential ideas that now form the basis of our democracy. The really interesting thing is that we know exactly what the early colonists were thinking about and the ideas that they thought were important in starting a new society because we know what they were reading. And we know what they were reading because we have access to the records of book sales in the early half of the 19th century. The Enlightenment came to Australia because a lot of people that came to Australia were creatures of the Enlightenment. Both the convicts and the free settlers were brought up in a world that was informed by Enlightenment views. So they themselves brought the Enlightenment to Australia and of course they brought the ideas of the Enlightenment in books. They imported books, they brought books with them in boats. Both the free settlers and even the convicts imported these ideas to, to the new continent. When the colonists were thinking about how to build their new society, they applied the ideas of economic freedom, the rule of law and equal rights. These are the foundations of modern Australia. Dr Chris Berg researched the book sales of economic and political texts between 1805 and 1849. He discovered that the wealth of nations dominated book sales during this period and it shaped the colonists' thinking about free enterprise. Among the most popular political books were two treatises of government, The History of England and Reflections on the Revolution in France. It was through works such as these that the institution of the rule of law was translated to the new colony. The commentaries on the laws of England were highly valued as a readable guide to the English common law. They provided the basis of equal rights and equality before the law. The ideas of the Enlightenment were literally packed up and shipped across to the other side of the world. We're fortunate that many of these classics have been preserved in the State Library of New South Wales. We've got a copy here of um, Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations, and here we have the 1805 copy. That's not altogether surprising that Adam Smith, in all sorts of ways, gave people a model of how the economy worked. The Wealth of Nations appeared in, in 1776, so we're just before, uh, in, the, in the lead up to the French Revolution, in the lead up now to the American Revolution, and 
as Smith wrote on, on both those topics. Adam Smith, the great Scottish philosopher and economist, um, he was the by far the most commonly read um, author in political science, in economics, even in, in philosophy in the Australian colonies. I think that's really important because that tells us how the Australian colonists thought of themselves. They thought of themselves as creatures of a sort of neoclassical enlightenment worldview. Now, the Wealth of Nations is grappling with a lot of the, the same questions that, that Smith was, was grappling with. Now, what drives you know, wealth? How does trade, how does capital movements, how do immigration you know, play into the whole that economic development process? It was the basic how to get wealthy guide which the colonists were going to. And it's a book that suggests that the way towards prosperity is through division of labour. Well, I think the, uh, the big idea in, in The Wealth of Nations is that there's some sort of um, self-organising uh, market order. So uh, the more individuals made out their own business affairs, the, the better he thought it was for society because the, using state control would mean vested interests got control of the economy and would use it for their own benefit. While they did a great deal of thinking about the political economy, the early settlers were also determined to establish British liberty. So we find them deeply engaged with the great classical Enlightenment thinkers such as John Locke, Edmund Burke and David Hume. John Locke was a 17th century English philosopher and physician and is regarded as being the father of liberalism. His work influenced French and Scottish Enlightenment thinkers as well as American revolutionaries. Well, John Locke was a product of the English Civil War in many ways. Um, he had to flee England uh, following the Restoration and before the Glorious Revolution because of the, the tensions of the time and the ideas he promoted. He's most famous for his two treatises on government, which really laid the foundations for liberal political philosophy throughout the, the intervening centuries. The core idea of the two treatises of government is that there is an implicit contract between the ruler and the ruled. So what is two treatises of government about? Well the first treatise dismisses a character called Filmer mm. who's arguing for a very traditional notion of political theory. This is Sir Robert Filmer mentioned here. Sir Robert yeah. Filmer um, who basically argues that a king's power is the power that enjoyed by Adam and was handed down all the way. The second treatise in the spirit of the Enlightenment is offering a rational basis for the power of government and it's uh, based on the idea of a contract. Well, the key idea in the second treatise really is that um, government is a result of the consent of the governed, um, the contract between the governed and the governing classes, uh, and particularly the importance of the role of property and conscience in providing citizens autonomy. Law and government is there to protect rights. This is a fundamental liberal idea, and we owe it to a great extent to John Locke. The early colonists saw themselves as part of Britain and they understood and valued its institutions. They were reading works like A History of England by David Hume, Scottish essayist, philosopher, historian and economist. David Hume, like John Locke, was one of the most influential thinkers of the Enlightenment. David Hume was known for many things, above all today he's known as a philosopher, but in his own time and in the time of colonial Australia, he was mainly known as an historian. His history of England, for example, was a repudiation of much of the narrative which the likes of John Locke had given England. His history of England was a bestseller. Hume has got a lot to say on the scientists as well as the political and religious movements of the age. The history of England on the whole supports traditional government it's very wary of revolt. He's critical of those that set off the English Civil War. Uh, and from it, of course, the early Australian colonialists would have derived quite a lot of ideas about the workings of the English Constitution. The early colonists were also very aware of a much more recent and much bloodier revolution, which had shaken Europe to its core, the French Revolution. So they turned to the works of Irish politician and philosopher Edmund Burke, who had written a damning account called Reflections of the Revolution in France. Well, Edmund Burke's possibly one of the most famous parliamentarians in history. He was as afraid of uh, the mob as he was of uh, state overreach. Edmund Burke famously, of course, criticised the English government at the time for 
the way it was treating the American colonists and, and pleaded with them to back off. But then not long after that uh, was of course one of the, world, one of the most famous um, critics of the French Revolution uh, and the tyranny that the mob could sometimes devolve into. Edmund Burke's reflections on the revolution in France but published in Melbourne. Published in Melbourne, indication of just how important as it was to uh, Australian colonists, the ideas that Burke had put forward. The great problem with the French Revolution was that it was trying to remake society overnight mm. and he argued that just wouldn't work, mm. that society needed the weight of tradition to hold it together. The whole experience of revolution was very strong in 19th century Australia. The French Revolution was deeply etched mm. into the consciousness of the elite mm. uh, and so one of the things that's on their mind is avoiding revolution mm. and how do you avoid a revolution when in a way you are remaking a society not overnight in the Australian case but you're making a new society mm. what are the dangers? While the colonists brought with them the enlightenment ideas and values of liberty and freedom they also brought with them the English common law. One of the first books that was chosen to be sent with the first fleet was Blackstone's Commentaries, which was essentially an encyclopedia of common law written in the 18th century by English lawyer William Blackstone. One of the great things about the Australian colonies was how quickly it adopted English common law. And um, it was in part because of the ideas of authors like William Blackstone and the tradition and heritage that um, the colonists brought with them. And that really helped the growth of the colony, the development of the early legal system. His big contribution, and what he mostly was, was a writer. I mean, that was where he had the most impact. Um, and it was because of his um, ability to articulate the English system of law that, that, where he made his greatest contribution in the commentaries. The great achievement of the commentaries is that it provides some order, provides some system mm. to what had been a fairly random ranchackle collection of precedents. And what he did was he pulled it all together for the first time and made it accessible so educated lay people could read his work and suddenly understand the system of English law. And this was going to be very important in new societies like the USA and Australia. He made it sing, if you like. He, he articulated in writing, which was really the only way to communicate in those days, um, what made the common law beautiful, what made it hang together, what, what was its magic. I don't think you can understand modern Australia without understanding the Enlightenment. The Enlightenment came to Australia because um, the people who came to Australia were creatures of the Enlightenment. They were building a society uh, that was the product of human endeavour, that wasn't just the product of historical inertia uh, and institutions that had been in place since time immemorial. They're looking for a new a blueprint for society which would enable them to develop a society which doesn't have the traditional sort of sanctions and bastions of an inherited aristocracy or Church of England. The idea that we can freely debate and deliberate um, the advancement of science, um, our market ec economy, um, the way we interact with one another, uh, right across all the fields of, uh, of our community, um, in my view has been strongly influenced by writers like Burke, um, the economists like Smith. They turned to the ideas within the books and the heritage that they had um, to figure out, to make those decisions. And they did so, I think, in really interesting ways, in ways that still shape the Australian society today. It's important that we know about the Enlightenment because it laid the foundations of the freedoms we enjoy today. We must preserve and defend these freedoms for future generations of Australians.